So I'm very, uh, very glad to be here. I was not aware that it is a full 25 years uh, since I uh, was here and uh, gave a lecture or two that I also remember very well and the discussions. And it was winter time, and at that time I believe that this uh, large plane that I saw from the of course, uh, landscape. I had no idea that it was a lake uh, because it was, uh, it was only after after a week or so someone told me the lake. Uh, it was it was all snow. And um, for today, I, I and being encouraged to do so, um, I uh, I'm not going to read a paper, but um, uh, summarize some thoughts from notes. Uh, in a lecture style, and uh, you have to live with my linguistic deficiencies, not being a native speaker of the language the, uh, we all speak. Uh, and um, I thought um, I should, in a way that uh, befits someone of my, of my age, uh, look back at some things uh, that I've written earlier and uh, relate to them, but only implicitly, and uh, maybe we will come back to that in the discussion. I started a very comment. So this is about the sociology of the state. Sociology of the state. I, I was trained as a sociologist and then in 1973 converted to be a, a political scientist, which I still um, but uh, these two layers uh, interact uh, very strongly, so sociology of the state is probably a, a, uh, the title uh, of this uh, intersection. And I start in a very conventional way by distinguishing structure and function, uh, which is always, I think, uh, a common way for sociologists to end with this, uh, apart from structural functionality, which is a different thing. So um, there are three defining structural features of states and statehood. Uh, there is first a territory, um, which is not uh, always the case in um, defined uh, territory that uh, uh, typically has a geographic name. The only exception that I can uh, think of uh, of this rule, geographic name is a state that is defunct now, the Union of Socialist Soviet Republics does not have a, a, a territorial name. It did not have. And um, so it was an open invitation to join. But I think that is the only exception. Uh, all the others have names. Their places on the map, and that means they have borders, uh, and these borders, in order to be borders, uh, must be recognized as borders um, from both sides of the border. And borders have a very important uh, uh, social and political function. Uh, you can uh, stop outward traffic and inward traffic. And that means traffic of persons, traffic of goods, traffic of investment. So this, uh, the, the modern state is a territorial state. And virtually all the surface of the globe, at least the land, uh, is uh, defined by statehood today. And uh, there are a few so-called territories that are not full states, but almost states. And they also have borders, and they are also recognized. Very important. Uh, thing, mm -hmm. and of course you can think of uh, uh, the phenomenon of so-called globalization, which perforate borders and make territories uncertain. Also, technologies of transportation and information allow us <coughs> to look across borders, uh, and that has a number of burnout and widely discussed uh, consequences. <coughs> Secondly, states have a people. A population. Empty territories um, constitute a problem uh, in its international relations, uh, in defense studies, security studies. So uh, uh, states, 
state territories are populated by people often referring to themselves as nations. And uh, uh, these uh, nations in territories have changed in history. Um, there are two ways of changing territories and nations. Uh, one is the inward changes of uh, drawing new borders and defining new territories. Uh, that is the uh, normal way of state building. Um, but there are many exceptions. Uh, Germany and Italy are exceptions where territories were redefined in the outward direction. That is, uh, territories were unified that used to be separate states. And uh, this unification has an impact, the territorial unification has an impact of uh, on the uh, population and the way the population refers to itself. Um, the famous saying from the Italian Risorgimento, one of the protagonists uh, said, now we have made Italy in a territorial sense. Let's, let's now start to make Italians. That is, people who refer to themselves as belonging to the Italian nation. But not all states have succeeded in that uh, uh, way of uh, um, identity unification. Uh, there are a number of states, Britain and uh, Spain being the most prominent in uh, Europe, that refer to themselves as multinational states. I remember, just to, to uh, a little anecdote here, I remember being invited to a um, rather official uh, a keynote speech uh, to the uh, Congress of the Basque Unions in Bilbao uh, a few years ago. And uh, when delivering that speech, I found myself standing between a European flag and a Basque flag. Something was missing. A Spanish flag. That was not in the room. And uh, so the, the, this is a, a precarious kind of uh, nationhood. That, uh, I'm, I'm skipping all the uh, problems, contemporary problems of state building, <coughs> nation building, as you know, these uh, dominate the day to day uh, news uh, about some parts. Uh, of the uh, uh, globe. Um, we have um, famous uh, historical analysis, Eugene Weber, uh, Anders Gellner among them, uh, Eric Hofsbaum, uh, who study the process of uh, nation building and state building and the interaction of the, uh, of the two. Uh, so this is many historical and historical sociology books uh, that do with this. The third component, necessary conceptual component of a state is an authority structure. Um, a structure that is um, um, able to make uh, collectively binding decisions and to prevail in Spanish, no coincidence that it is in Spanish, is called poderes fáticos. That is factual powers which um, uh, are reluctant to subordinate themselves under the rule of uh, the central power, thereby making the rule of a central power precarious. Uh, such uh, factual powers, which have no constitutional status, but nevertheless may challenge the <coughs> authority structure that is necessary for statehood, uh, include uh, uh, the military or armed forces which uh, escape from the control of the central government, separatist 
forces, also Spanish examples, uh, religious forces, ethno-religious forces, but also uh, uh, criminal organizations. I mean, think of Mexico uh, today, or Guatemala. Um, and you can also uh, think of uh, state sovereignty or state authority as the ultimate source of collectively binding decisions being challenged by supranational or international forces, poderes facticos, uh, that interfere with the uh, monopoly of force or violence uh, of a given state. I mean, if you ask uh, Greek uh, journalists uh, uh, today what they are, what they get about them hearing the term poderes facticos, they will uh, probably uh, first think of the German government as a uh, factual power that uh, plays a large role of the EU, but <coughs> not coincidentally uh, Germany in particular, that interferes with the centralized multipolistic authority of the state, of the Greek state in, in this case. Now, this is a very, very rough review uh, of the three elements that make up a state. Let me now turn to two state functions uh, that uh, emerge from this structure. Uh, Max Weber explicitly stated that um, we cannot specify state functions that apply to all states, thereby, or we cannot specify the ends of state that are valid in all cases. There's an uh, endless uh, number of state purposes or objectives uh, or the ends of statehood, so we can define a state only by the means the state is applying, namely the means of uh, uh, coercion uh, to which uh, the state, in order to be a state, must control the monopoly against poderes faticos competing <coughs> with uh, state power. I think that is an overly pessimistic uh, view, and I try out on you at I think I would uh, be able to defend uh, uh, the argument needed f uh, for the thesis that um, there are two functions that are common to all modern states um, and um, which can be distinguished slightly schematically in the following way. Uh, the first is the function states are organized in order to protect. Uh, the, the protective function, internal uh, uh, dimension of that protection is whatever uh, we associate with the police function. States maintain order by protecting individual citizens from civic violence. They protect their uh, property, they protect their health, their life, and, and so on. And the equivalent externally is, uh, of course, the, the military defending the borders, defending the territory. Um, this is another. But there are many uh, dimensions of uh, protection. You can speak of uh, social protection cultural protection, health protection, environmental protection, consumer protection. Uh, a recent term in international law uh, is um, the responsibility of states to protect the populations of other states. Responsibility to protect Libya is uh, an example, um, has been now enshrined into the uh, rule system of international law. So there are many um, kinds of protection that states uh, generate, but I, I think uh, all states 
uh, are expected to and adopt the responsibility to protect, if not in all, but in some of these uh, dimensions. Otherwise, they do not function as state. As soon as they are unable, and that is something that uh, already uh, Thomas Hobbes knew, uh, if they are unable to protect, maintain peace, control unauthorized violence, that means uh, rebellion against state power is legitimate. So uh, the first uh, purpose or end or objective of state is to protect. And the second is to promote. All modern states um, try to promote development, growth, modernization, and they do so in all kinds of uh, ways, of which the promotion of capitalist growth has become the dominant after the end of the Soviet Union, which also tried to promote growth and development, of course, industrialization. Um, so uh, why does the state uh, function as a promoter of growth and capitalist development, modernization, industrialization. Um, and one answer to that question, and there are exceptions to this, uh, uh, the so-called petrol states, uh, or some of them, Saudi Arabia being the best example probably, have refrained from such a program of modernization, and you could say also uh, the Russian Federation today is a quasi petro state uh, based entirely upon, or almost entirely upon, extractive industries, primary sector <coughs> and extractive uh, industries. That is certainly uh, the case uh, with. Saudi Arabia, although not with the Emirates, who have understood that uh, their sources of wealth is um, are limited, and therefore they need to engage into a process of development, growth, industrialization, economic modernization, however you want to, uh, to call it. And the only means by which any state today <coughs> can uh, engage in this process of modernization is uh, uh, capitalist modernization based upon property rights, freedom of contract, uh, and a few other things. Why is it that states are fixated on this purpose of um, growth, modernization, industrialization, and so on? Uh, the answer is twofold, I think. They cannot but uh, uh, do so, a functionalist, a shaky functionalist argument, because they are self interested. States have a self interest in the fruits of growth. Uh, policy making presupposes re control over resources, such as taxes and taxes can flow only as dividends of uh, economic growth. In order to run a state and to succeed in government, uh, you need resources and they derive from capitalist development. That is one argument. The other argument is in order to keep the population of the state, the nation, united and uh, uh, reasonably peaceful. Uh, you have to reconcile conflicting interests. And that is only possible if you organize, if you manage to organize a positive sum gain within the state. And that is, that presupposes growth again. Yeah. <coughs> um, so uh, states and economic growth uh, are an equation that you find everywhere, with the exception of primary extractive industries-based states uh, in the modern world, 
And uh, this link can be explained with a few days, self-interested and maintaining peace without growth, the uh, conflict turn into a zero-sum conflict, and zero-sum conflict, or the negative-sum conflicts, are particularly uh, dangerous for the maintenance of the unity of the population. Contemporary states are modernizing states, uh, and um, they rely uh, without any major exception upon ca capitalist methods of uh, uh, economic modernization. In order to modernize, states do two things. They uh, develop the forces of production, to use the Marxist terminology, the forces of production, both uh, uh, capital goods, they engage uh, in the support and guidance of research and development, and uh, labor, the other force of production uh, that uh, can be developed. Nature, the third one, cannot really be developed. It can be better exploited, but not uh, improved. In most cases, that's true. So education, uh, skill, human capital formation are uh, a second method by which states pursue the goal of uh, promoting uh, development. And they uh, uh, create a legal framework uh, that guarantees property rights and contract, the freedom of contract, that is, markets. They do so, the latter, developing markets in two ways, um, uh, namely by opening markets, often border transcending markets, and by regulating markets. These are the two uh, modes of uh, promoting uh, and uh, maintaining uh, markets. M market making, something that uh, is the basic logic of uh, European integration for 50 years now, market making uh, means the abolition of privileges, of rigidities, of feudal residues, but also the abolition of borders or the, the perforation of uh, uh, borders. Borders must be open to, in the uh, Constitution of the European Union, it says, goods, people, investment, and services. Uh, uh, borders must be open, that is market making. At the same time, market regulation, market confining, is a uh, <coughs> A process that we find consistently, um, uh, uh, simultaneously, market making and market confining and regulating. Um, so uh, the, the basic intuition here is that competition of suppliers in markets must be regulated so that competition takes place in only two dimensions. And all the other dimensions are prohibited, effectively prohibited. What are the two dimensions? Competition must be about prices, and it must be about quality or novelty of uh, products, and nothing else. Competition, of course, as we know for many uh, historical as well as contemporary um, examples, can uh, be based upon fraud. It can be based upon violence. Think of the competition of drug cartels in Colombia and Mexico. Right? Um, it can be uh, based upon consumer deception uh, and many other illegitimate modes of conducting competition. So uh, regulation means excluding as much as you can, and that is a wide open question, how much you can. 
excluding as much as you can uh, these pathological symptoms of uh, market competition, also ruling out illegal markets for people, for instance, or for drugs or for weapons, um, and so on. So, so this is uh, a package of uh, the state's agendas. Now come a few problems. By giving absolute priority to capitalist growth and modernization, states create centers of socioeconomic power. Centers of socioeconomic power of investors which can overpower the political power of states, particularly as states depend on the recognition and support of citizens which is contingent upon employment and social spending. So that is a lot. Let me, let me, uh, the key term here is the term power, which is one um, of the uh, most important uh, terms in the social sciences. I mean, economics, sociology, philosophy, uh, political science, all use the term of power. And, um, I once had a collection of 79 definitions of power, and this was certainly not complete. So it's a central concept, widely used, widely used beyond academic discourses in everyday language, but it is not, not um, agreed upon. Or at least there are some great works uh, uh, which uh, provide uh, um, definitions. One of my favorites is Karl Deutsch, who uh, says uh, power is the ability to afford not to learn, which is very useful in many, many contexts. So that is something that I'm currently working upon, uh, the, the clarification of the concept of power and modes of using power for economic as well as political purposes. Let me uh, elaborate a bit on this. Um, in my view, and there are other views uh, which I cannot fully absorb into this, although I must recognize that they uh, have a lot to say. In my view, uh, power can be defined as the ability of an agent to present other agents with alternatives of which the mutually less preferred one <coughs> is less undesirable for the holder of this ability than for the agent that is subject to it. So this is again very complex, but it can be uh, clarified, I hope, by uh, examples. Uh, so take the uh, famous um, uh, situation of an immediate threat, um, uh, a bank robbery. Someone enters the bank uh, with a gun and um, the discourse that uh, unfolds is well known. The man with the gun says to the bank clerk, money or life. This is an alternative, right? and the alternative for the uh, bank clerk is handing over the money or being killed, corresponding to the power agents. Um, and um, the, the power agent, the robber in this situation, making a credible threat, uh, has the order of preferences that he would much prefer to get hold of the money rather than to kill the person in question. Because uh, if he uh, kills him, he will be subject to very serious uh, criminal prosecution, and also chances are that he does not get the money. So it's, it's definitely the second best uh, solution for the bank robber to kill the person uh, whom he encounters in the bank. But the 
undesirability of the second space is much greater on the part of the recipient of the critical threat, namely the bank clerk, who, let us assume, would do everything to keep alive, and for whom it is the worst evil that can happen to him um, in case um, he actually gets killed. So there is this um, discrepancy in the undesirability of the second best outcome, uh, which uh, accounts for the power of the robber in this case. And there are similar examples in Hobbes which work exactly the same uh, way. And Hobbes adds that uh, this uh, use of a credible threat is in no way a limitation of freedom of the person in question, the bank clerk. Because the bank clerk is perfectly free to decide what to do. This is, the, 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 I mean, as Quentin Skinner in his recent books on Hobbes has shown, is an absolutely cynical view of the situation of the bank clerk. Right? But it is not untrue. Uh, he is free to um, follow <coughs> the course of action that he considered the lesser evil. He is not, that would be coercion, he is not being killed. He is conditionally being killed and he is free to choose among these uh, conditions. And I'm tempted at this point to enter into a little um, um, a reference to a philosophical debate on the meaning of freedom, which is uh, everywhere in all political theory and uh, philosophy journals, you have articles these days on, on freedom. It's a hotly debated uh, the concept. Uh, and liberal market freedom uh, is um, the key organizational device of the state's promotional strategy. Freedom is something that is granted by the state, freedom of property and freedom of exchange of property, uh, that is contract. Um, but uh, there are two uh, shortcomings in this liberal concept of freedom and the Republican uh, concept of freedom are counterposed to the liberal concept of uh, freedom. Um, uh, the two arguments uh, against the liberal concept of freedom or its sufficiency are first that freedom is available only to those who happen to be in the possession of marketable items and find partners to enter into contracts with. The freedom of property and the guarantee of property is not a guarantee that every person has <coughs> property, but it is a, a, a freedom guaranteed by the state for the purpose of the promotion of growth to uh, uh, the freedom to those who have to be in the possession of property titles uh, uh, to do so. Uh, this is not a guarantee of everyone's property. And also this, the second uh, complication in the, the elaboration of the concept of liberal freedom is that any use of freedom generates <coughs> negative externalities. Even my freedom to speech here prevents all of you, I mean, I, uh, have, I regret that, uh, to, to speak at the same time, right? Civilized as all of you are. Uh, so, um, <coughs> every use of freedom has negative externalities, depriving others of their freedom, and then the question is, uh, how do we balance, and what do, do we count as negative externalities? Let me stop the, the philosophical arguments uh, here. Uh, 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 except for saying that, uh, uh, and there's a German uh, sociological theorist, uh, Niklas Luhmann, who has made the point very effectively, that um, uh, in order to exercise power, the actual 
confrontation, the actual confrontation of power holder and the subject of power does not take place. It can be symbolically generalized. It works through anticipation. Uh, and if uh, you know someone is able to use credible threats, then you will follow the first priorities of this person, even in the absence of a actual um, uh, threat or the, the posing of the alternative uh, that I spoke uh, about. So power works through anticipation of credible threats, not only through the actuality of credible uh, uh, threats. Now, what makes threats credible? Threats are the more credible, the greater the openness of borders is in economic terms. And uh, the easier exit options are as a consequence. Uh, this is a, a, a very important uh, uh, aspect of economic power uh, today. If you can leave the territory uh, and thereby uh, deprive uh, the local population of employment <coughs> and the state of taxes. Uh, if you can do that, uh, then uh, you have the means to pose a credible threat. And uh, the options to do so are multiplied by everything that we associate with globalization, that is, the thinning of borders. Um, foreign direct investment, outsourcing, offshoring are the terms that we know for. Uh, and, and they pose threats. Threats uh, that you uh, cannot uh, neutralize in a world that is organized uh, as our world is. Uh, borders lose their effectiveness and this effect undermines state power. That is uh, uh, an important point that has often been observed. So it's no novelty, but uh, it still was uh, reminding us of. Threats are furthermore, the more credible, the more atomized, anonymous, and short-termist power holders are. That is, the more the principle of shareholder value prevails, and individual agents can afford to ignore the indirect, collective, and long-term um, externalities of what they are doing. Uh, the more they can also ignore the beneficial effects of the state's taxing, spending, and regulatory capacity upon their own interest, rightfully understood. So, atomization, disorganization, uh, individualization, uh, the uh, corrosion of modes of collective action, action of market parties will make credible threats easier to uh, implement. Uh, and um, that is an aspect that can be pursued, uh, could be pursued by the specialists specialist on sociology of knowledge. Uh, if you are a, uh, a encompassing uh, trade union organizing an entire industrial sector, you have a relatively high aggregate level of collective action. And then you will be able, that is a thought that originally was formulated by Wolfgang Strie, uh, then you will act responsibly. You measure and uh, reflect upon the collective, the relevant externalities that are caused by your action. If you are uh, a 30-member uh, uh, syndicalist entity that is committed to struggle at the shop floor of your company and nothing else. You will 
you are much more individualized or atomized or anonymous. And therefore, you will uh, get along without these reflections. So your state of mind, your perception of consequences of your action, your calculus of success and so on, will be determined by the uh, organizational level or the uh, uh, aggregate level of uh, collective action. And uh, uh, for, uh, it is interesting uh, to remember that throughout the 70s and 80s, uh, the German uh, uh, corporate uh, actors and their association referred to Germany as Germany Incorporated something that is aggregated, integrated, organized at a very high level. Uh, all externalities were registered somehow, not all, but somehow many of them were registered and weighed against the advantages of uh, encompassing organizations. Today this has fallen apart. Uh, the uh, industry level uh, is uh, largely irrelevant for making collective agreements. Collective agreements are made at the company level, at the department level, or at the individual level. So this, this uh, aggregation and a whole range of consequences of action escapes from attention and awareness. Uh, uh, so uh, a development from tripartism or corporatism uh, and a long-term comprehensive responsibility, a social partnership, uh, the weighing of what uh, uh, outcomes are acceptable, the practice of stepping into the shoes of others in order to uh, reflect upon the consequences of what I do for them and what they might do in return and so on. These practices have uh, disappeared from the scene um, practices that have a great tradition in, uh, in the uh, social sciences um, and um, Hegel is one uh, also who spoke about the disciplining effect of the formation of corporations rather than individual market participants. And uh, uh, Elie Durkheim uh, did the same. He thought the synthesis of civil society can be guaranteed through such wise and uh, uh, considerate, considerate is the term, um, collective uh, actors that have uh, disappeared from uh, uh, the scene. Uh, Wolfgang Schräg in another context has recently used the term economic patriotism. Uh, that is a motivation that uh, is informed by the sense of responsibility toward the national economy. That is a moral attitude uh, that uh, was in some countries for some periods of time prevalent, but has totally disappeared uh, under the uh, perspective of uh, uh, shareholder value, uh, where ownership changes from one day to the next, consequences uh, are without any interest and, and so on. Marx in this context spoke of the anarchy of uh, capitalist production. Not all capitalist production has been anarchic at all times, but today it clearly is, and it helps to disempower the state. It is undermining state authority, not just state borders, uh, and it is dividing state populations. It is destructive of statehood. And um, uh, it, it creates a condition of the powerlessness of, uh, of the state. Um, and uh, this again is widely described, analyzed, uh, debated uh, in political science uh, journals where a whole set of new concepts has uh, become prominent. Uh, one of these concepts is state capacity. Another one is governing capacity. Uh, another one is 
governability or ungovernability, a term that has not been uh, coined uh, before 1971 when it first appeared in the social science literature. But since then, it's all over the place, and, uh, and I've even been asked to write a handbook article on ungovernability, which I gladly have done. Uh, but that would be impossible 30 years ago, because it is very marginal. So uh, the question whether this, uh, the state as defined and uh, in terms of its structure and function uh, is something that we can uh, count upon uh, in the foreseeable uh, future particularly also given uh, the fact that states, today's states, consistently and universally suffer from a condition, also a new term, fiscal starvation, austerity. Um, um, and uh, a term that is older but has not been taken up uh, very much in the uh, literature. The state is driven by or a prisoner of markets. And if you read the European newspapers these days, you find this diagnosis of states being uh, undermined, driven, and uh, incapacitated by markets on every page. And for very good reasons, I can assure you, and maybe the day after tomorrow, we have new examples for how states can be disorganized by markets, in this case by financial markets. How do states respond to their condition of being put in question in, in this way? Uh, we have a long uh, history, probably from 73 to uh, 74. The mid-70s are the turning point of many things. Uh, and that applies perhaps more to Europe than it does to the United States, but we, we could compare. How do states uh, respond to their uh, disorganization through economic power? Some terms uh, that are relevant here uh, are privatization, privatization of infrastructure, education, health, the media, but also the repressive state functions, prisons, uh, military, the police, um, are uh, uh, being privatized. And this is accompanied by a um, jurisprudence, uh, the European Court of Justice being uh, one example of this, a jurisprudence that uh, claims that uh, states um, are basically taking away business from potential entrepreneurs. To run a public radio station or to run a public TV program is depriving potential investors of the opportunity to make profit. Therefore, it is deeply illegitimate. Uh, another example, Italy, the uh, a referendum on the privatization of water that took place in June. Uh, the, the water industry um, um, uh, claims that by making uh, water a public domain, both the supply and the processing of water and, uh, and so on, is a, a kind of robbery. The state robs the uh, uh, private sector of profitable investment uh, opportunities. So that uh, privatization uh, together with deregulation is uh, something that is a, a response of a state giving in to the new constellation of power. Another, uh, another important thing, uh, uh, development, again a new term. New terms are always indicators of something. Uh, a new term uh, that you do not find more than 30 years ago in the social science literature. And since that time, you find universities, professional schools, journals in which title, name, uh, the, this term appears is governance. I'm myself teaching at the School of Government. It's a bit <laughs> governance. Um, and governance <laughs> means uh, in order for states to 
formulate and implement a collectively binding decision such as a law. You need to cooperate in the formulation of this law with non-state actors. Cooperation, the formation of alliances, uh, the building of mutual understandings um, is what uh, uh, state uh, actors respond to this new uh, power situation. A third one is uh, uh, the concept which has also <coughs> had a resurgence since the late 18th century when uh, Adam Ferguson introduced the term that it was uh, sleeping as it were for 150 years and then it came up again uh, is uh, civil society. Uh, the emphasis upon civil engagement uh, uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, the new literature on opinion campaigns and nudges, all point into uh, the direction that states must be supplemented by something uh, uh, different. The legal logic, um, uh, let me shift to, to one other uh, uh, state response and then, uh, then I stop. What we see in public finance is a shift of, a paradigm shift of uh, uh, hegemonic doctrines. Um, uh, uh, the paradigm shift is from taxes as the basis of public finance to credit as the basis of public finance. And that makes for much of the turmoil that we have seen over the past years. Let me elaborate very briefly. Taxes are authoritatively imposed and enforced duties of citizens as earners and spenders of income. Earners direct taxes, spenders indirect taxes. It is a duty to pay taxes. And if you do not fulfill that duty, you will be uh, punished. And there are the administrative means available, not in Greece, but in most other places, uh, uh, to enforce uh, the tax. Uh, law and make people take, uh, pay uh, the taxes. Europeans don't even know that they pay taxes when buying uh, a pack of cigarettes. Uh, uh, in America, you made um, uh, you made aware because taxes show up different, uh, different. Credit in uh, in uh, financing, in contrast, is a voluntary contractual relation between sellers and buyers of financial titles. Uh, and this is governed by prices, which in the case of credits are called interest rates. Uh, so uh, from a relationship of duty to a relationship of uh, contracts is the shift of, uh, from taxes to credit as the source of, of, uh, a source of uh, public finance. The distributional logic involved can also be uh, very roughly uh, be described by a, the following <coughs> distinction. Uh, the progressive direct uh, taxation of income, corporate and uh, private income, uh, works in the following way. Receivers of high market incomes pay taxes, thereby suffering a loss of their disposable income and according to all doctrines of uh, uh, taxation, rightly so, because they can afford to be taxed at a higher marginal tax rate than uh, lower income or medium income uh, earners. In contrast, credit and sovereign debt uh, works in the following distributional way. Receivers of high income by government bonds, thereby receiving an increment in their disposable income. And uh, these increments play an important role in the increase of, uh, uh, of inequality. Uh, so uh, this is a paradigm shift uh, in uh, public finance, uh, the consequences of which we are currently uh, let me uh, end with three concluding generalizations. First, due to the fiscal crisis and regulatory disempowerment of states, they become incapable of fulfilling their promotional, growth-enhancing, economic, modernizing functions. 
And the Social Democrats in Europe are desperately trying to find new ways they proclaim uh, third ways, uh, they pro uh, claim a third industrial uh, uh, revolution in order to re-empower the state in line with the uh, uh, developmental model uh, of statehood. Second, even if they were able to promote growth and employment, they would, states would fail. Their capacity to do so is undermined by all the uh, mechanisms and developments I have summarized. Even if they were able to continue to promote growth and employment, they would fail to address the key problems that, I mean, no one really disagrees, will dominate the politics of the 21st century. These three problems are energy, climate, security. And they are closely interwoven. As you know, reading every second newspaper article shows on international politics, and they will not be solved through more growth to the contrary. And uh, uh, this is an insight that is totally pushed to the side uh, by uh, uh, many observers of the current uh, crisis. Thirdly, together with the capacity to promote, they lose. The states lose their capacity to protect, which is the other major bundle of state function. They lose their capacity to protect. They lose their capacity uh, to protect uh, through regulation and redistribution. Uh, as a consequence, growing segments of the population, the so-called precari uh, precariat, and I see with pleasure that my friend Guy Standing is going to speak here, and he will elaborate in all uh, detail on what the precariat is. The precariat is an unprotected class. There is no security, no predictability, no reliability, no what he calls with the felicitous term, shadow of the future. There is nothing to be taken for granted uh, for the class and uh, its uh, response uh, uh, accordingly. This class, uh, as we have seen, uh, not just in Paris, London, Athens, and other places, uh, is engaged in short-lived riots without any political meaning. It is symptomatic of a class that is has fallen out of any social uh, uh, integration. It can also result in protest movements with clear demands, a rudimentary leadership uh, structure, as we have seen them in the 15M movement in Madrid, or the recent very interesting movement um, uh, in Tel Aviv, or uh, uh, the Spanish Indignados, um, and so on. And the third possibility of political outcomes of this weakening destruction of statehood is uh, a rightist populism. Uh, that is based upon a frightened middle class um, uh, ready to turn to authoritarianism that is deprived, feels deprived and rightly so from the uh, protection of a state that is failing as a state. Thank you very much. Sorry for what you said. But how, however, you did refer to capitalism quite a bit in your talk. And I've had an ongoing uh, disagreement or discussion with a couple of my Democratic friends as to um, how, you, how one would describe the economy of the United States. Um, and uh, my friends would say it's very difficult to um, determine how much of our economy is socialistic because we have subsidies and uh, uh, Medicare in place and Social Security and how much of it would be uh, capitalistic. So to refer to the United States as a capitalistic economy is really um, a misrepresentation. Uh, how would you answer, uh, my friends? Okay, uh, capitalist states to return to a, to a concept that I developed in the 70s and, and uh, used uh, since that time, will uh, depend upon 
functioning statehood. And functioning statehood means promotion of growth and development, <coughs> which includes, for instance, the agricultural sector. That's for uh, um, a reason that I'm not going into, cannot uh, operate as an ongoing business without massive subsidization. Uh, they, they have the handicap that they depend on seasons and that uh, the, uh, uh, the supply changes with seasons and, uh, and so on. So, so th that is a major part of the subsidies. Also, uh, uh, <coughs> all capitalist systems depend upon devices of maintaining peace and unity within the state population, which uh, require uh, uh, some measure of protection. Protection, uh, uh, be it uh, in the form of welfare, be it in the form of uh, uh, health uh, uh, services, be it in the form of uh, education. The uh, uh, one characteristic of modern societies, and this is opening a wide uh, perspective, is that individuals are structurally unable to help themselves in all conditions. Therefore, in order to maintain a measure of social integration, they need to be helped, be it through voluntary, be it through state-organized uh, services. Repression alone won't work. Uh, therefore, you need uh, uh, subsidies and, and services, which no one really denies. I, I, I think, I mean, some extreme libertarians uh, would uh, uh, disagree, uh, but uh, I, I think uh, the broad uh, spectrum of, uh, uh, I mean, serious uh, people speaking about this, including economic liberals, would not deny that uh, some residual functions of keeping uh, the ongoing system alive need to be taken over by the state and the uh, uh, decision uh, on private conflicts, uh, private court uh, conflicts, private law conflicts uh, is uh, something that everyone would uh, um, agree. The court system cannot be fully privatized. And, and uh, so it's, it's no surprise to find that in capitalist societies there is no indication that they are not capitalist. Uh, 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 the state is required for the purpose of maintaining uh, the social peace uh, and, uh, 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 and integration. I, I think that that's well, not good for a, for a, for a serious argument and uh, disagreement. <laughs> um, you ended with say, uh, explaining how the conditions you describe can generate a uh, rightist populism because the yes, state, one, the state is no longer capable of the protection or development functions. I'm curious about how you understand the um, Tea Party movement here in the United States because that, for some of us, we see it as rightist populism, and yet they are calling, their ideology calls for an even weaker state, yes. Um, yes. which we could call we false consciousness, I guess, but, but it seems. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, this is a phenomenon that we definitely do not have in Europe, and many <laughs> people are interested in, in understanding what the, what the uh, roots and the strategies and, and the internal development uh, is. I'm, I'm very interested in coming closer to an understanding. What we uh, find in, uh, in Europe is a uh, protection-seeking middle-class anxiety. Uh, you need subsidies, you need to be <coughs> protected from foreign competitors, meaning migration in the, in the uh, job market. You need uh, uh, tax concessions, tax uh, 
uh, reduction <coughs> in order to survive as a small supplier of services of, of uh, a commercial uh, <coughs> uh, enterprise. And so this is very, uh, very uh, uh, popular. And that is uh, what in, in many countries has led to uh, populist movements of protest against not the state against the wrong priorities that are reflected in state budget. They should protect us rather than give it to them. We do not need, right? do not build universities, subsidize uh, uh, the agrarian sector, small agrarian sector. And, um, and in particular, strengthen borders for good and for <coughs> <coughs> and uh, that is uh, uh, what is uh, uh, very popular. Uh, the ethnocentric uh, uh, component uh, of this is um, it is um, uh, very different in uh, at various point of time, different countries. You do have uh, a Scandinavian or Scandinavian that is Norwegian and Danish. Uh, party that started as an anti-tax party, the so-called progress party in both countries, and that has now uh, fully turned to the anti-migration uh, uh, agenda, and they they accept that taxes are necessary and uh, 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 anti-migration, uh, and uh, this dramatic incident with Mr. Breivik in, in uh, Oslo uh, recently uh, is an outgrowth of the rent of that, uh, of that moment. I think the premise of my question probably was wrong. If you weren't saying people were turning to stronger states so much as what you described as the state doing what they wanted for them, yeah. which does overlap with the Tea Party agenda. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, I quite interested in the Tea idea of the assumption of growth, this kind of popular assumption that we'll have continual growth. And I'm wondering if there are examples of states that are exercising their protective and promotion powers without a growth okay. assumption. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I, I mean, this is the, uh, the critique of growth. There is an intellectual movement, international uh, intellectual movement that uh, you find uh, uh, self-describing itself uh, as the beyond growth or be beyond GDP uh, uh, movement. And you have a very important speakers of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, I mean, the, the uh, uh, Sen uh, Stiglitz Fidusi report initiated by the French government uh, a uh, parliamentary enquete commission in, in the German parliament, uh, Britain, uh, Tim Johnson, Jackson, Jackson. Tim Jackson uh, is the uh, representative also. So uh, the idea is uh, not only uh, is it very difficult for uh, uh, governments to promote uh, growth in the way they have done in the past because mature economies do not grow that much anymore and if they did it would be a disaster. Uh, what do we do instead? Uh, and and what, uh, 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 how do we address uh, uh, the pathologies of growth, climate change, environmental destruction? Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, situation where the entire uh, adult population for the major part of their life is supposed to participate in the labor market, that is, earn their income through the labor market, while the absorption capacity of the mature labor markets is declining. And uh, this is one of the reasons. You so there is, a, uh, uh, there is a debate, international debate, of what, uh, uh, how can we reform states so that they are uh, overcome their fixation on on growth, and uh, I mean the, the basic income movement uh, is uh, certainly one uh, answer, one partial answer to that uh, question. Uh, 
It is not that uh, unemployment is uh, uh, increasing. It has always been high since 1974, the turning point of the post era uh, in most European systems. It is that the quality of employment is going down. That is, the wages you earn, the security uh, that you have, the careers you have, what you can, uh, how much to the extent to which you can use your skills on your job, and, and so on. And the result of this, inferior quality of jobs to the extent is what is captured with this new phrase again uh, unknown ten years ago uh, of the precariat right? mm -hmm. precariousness of uh, economic activities that cannot even be described as a job and uh, European social democrats are uh, very conservative in the sense um, that they hold fast to the idea that the state must promote growth and, as a consequence, employment. And if not in conventional modes, in new modes. And, and the, uh, one leader of the German Social Democrats, uh, actually the chairperson of the uh, Social Democrats, Sigmar Gabriel, has come up with a uh, manifesto. Uh, uh, calling for the third industrial revolution in order to regain full employment and growth. Right? They are trapped in, in the old paradigm and uh, they are not winning much ground. Uh, with that. So I know you wanted to avoid the philosophical discussion on the term power. But well, I want to know kind of why you chose this definition, because um, I wonder is the definition elastic enough to describe the problem you're talking about? In particular, you talk about one of the dimensions of power is that it creates a condition where a person has to choose an undesirable option, right? But it also seems that one, what you're talking about is a form of domination, and two, it seems as if it's not only that it's creating things that are undesirable, but also things that are necessarily desirable. So we think about education, for example. With the linking between education and the market, we wouldn't say that education is something undesirable. But what's happening is, is that link is creating a condition where education becomes so necessarily desirable to such an extent where there's also additional externalities the cost of schooling, um, the privatization of schooling. But it, it would be odd to say education in and of itself is an undesirable thing. No, I don't think that was the implication of what I, of what I tried to uh, say. I mean, yeah. uh, education is something, as you point out, necessary because yeah. The uneducated labor power is worthless in today's labor market, right? Yep. In order to function as a participant in labor markets and having something to sell, uh, you need uh, uh, a, uh, a diploma of what kind. And if you don't have it, then you are uh, definitely, uh, uh, I mean, a candidate for belonging to the underclass or whatever. Uh, you want to call it uh, the, the, the sub precariat, right? Or the uh, lower part of the precariat. Um, so, uh, I, I mean, this, this is uh, easy to agree on. I, I don't uh, see the relation to, to power. So, the reason I'm asking is because you define power as having the condition of ordering the preferences and creating the conditions that something is undesirable. Yes. Right. But to a different extent for the two participants in the relationship. Yes, mm. definitely. But I'm wondering is how would that definition of power apply to the reconfiguration of education itself, right? So it doesn't seem as if the power relationship, that's how you're defining it, is creating undesirable conditions for wanting more education. It seems that what's happening is the undesirability is occurring in the case of how it's relating to cre the creation of new preferences. I guess what I'm asking more specifically is that 
the, your definition of power has a normative dimension to it that's not clarified under the how you define desirability. Right? Well, I, I, I would minimize the the, the normative uh, content of undesirable. I ask people uh, uh, what their preferences are, and uh, then I find that the bank clerk will definitely uh, uh, do everything uh, to uh, uh, avoid the worst outcome, and therefore hand over the money. Right? And, and how that applies to uh, education. Maybe, I mean, what Stephen Luke's a previous speaker, this uh, series has done in this uh, new version of his old book, 2005 uh, book on, uh, on power, uh, is uh, highlight the, what is going on at the, what he calls the third phase of power. I feel strongly, if you happen to, if you seem to, uh, to know this. Uh, uh, the formation of preference itself uh, and the, uh, the, uh, the formative process that goes into preference formation. That is nothing that, uh, that I was uh, speaking about, but I, I find this a very, very important uh, uh, set of thoughts uh, that I've also used in my own work, but I left that out uh, in, in this discussion, and education is certainly a process, whatever else it is, uh, in which preferences are shaped. And the ability to reformulate one's own preferences and learn what we really want is also shaped. And, and uh, uh, so that is uh, uh, together with mass media and uh, uh, religious organizations, they. Uh, uh, must be analyzed under the uh, aspect of uh, the formation of preferences. But I was talking about given preferences in these simplistic model cases that I've uh, used for illustration purposes. I'd, I'd like to um, use my advantage as chair to ask a, a question. Uh, there's an alternative way of telling the story of the present era from the one you did. So the way that you characterized it is that there was an erosion of the capacity of the state by virtue of things like globalization, that is the change in the relationship of states to markets, and the corrosive of state mm -hmm. capacities, and the privatization and deregulation moves the consequences of that. That is what that is, the erosion of the state's capacity resulted in a political configuration which then made possible the dismantling of these institutions. That's one version. An alternative version is that there was a political conflict in the 70s resulting from a previous period of strengthened collective power of labor, which led to a defeat of supporters of the affirmative state under an, a new ideological configuration, which came to be known as neoliberalism, which then promoted deregulation and privatization, which is what eroded the capacity of the state. That is, the states would have been perfect if, if it hadn't been for privatization and deregulation. The capacity of the state to contend with the corrosive processes that globalization posed would have been perfectly sufficient to deal with it. Um, because they, there was no inherent reason why Free capital flows, the elimination of capital regular, you know, capital constraints had to happen. That was a political move. It was because, you know, and that and that that's it's really the financialization of markets which has undercut the capacity of state. But that was a political move. That wasn't something dictated by markets. It was something that was a victory for political forces, which then set in motion these incapacity producing things. Okay. So a much more political story about the winners and losers in political arenas, which resulted in the dismantling of affirmative states capacities around borders, around finance, especially around finance, which is... We, we would have to enter into a much more fine-grained analysis of what happened in Britain between 1976 and 82, right? and, and the triumph of Thatcherism. Yeah. And, uh, and the US in the 80s. Uh, uh, okay, the neoconservative uh, 
hegemonic uh, uh, role and, and so so uh, it is it is both I think that it can be uh, it can be well integrated um, and one of the logic of this deep uh, discontinuity that happened in these years mid 70s right oil crisis is one, uh, one important thing uh, the end of social democracy as we knew it the resignation in Germany of Willy Brandt in 1974. They, these are all data that cluster at, at, at this one. One way to read the story is uh, a sour grape reaction on the part of political elites. As we can't do it anymore, we do not want to do it anymore. We give in to uh, neoliberal doctrines and hegemony. And that will happen with new labor and, and its consequences which are also laid in the, uh, in the 70s. Uh, uh, another version that I uh, would favor, but I think the two do not exclude each other, would, would be to say um, uh, that the means by which states can govern the economy have been taken out of their hands by the uh, internationalization or globalization or the exit options of investors. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so that, uh, of course, uh, the European left social democrats who were uh, tied to this uh, model of the activist developmental protective state uh, had to uh, give up and uh, uh, find something new, if you want to call it that, uh, in the face of changed economic realities, uh, which uh, uh, were evolving at, at that time. And I would think these changed uh, economic realities, um, and not just uh, political uh, struggles, uh, shaped to a great extent the outcome uh, that we observe in in various countries, and we, we have to look at it. European integration turns out as a uh, giant economic uh, opportunity structure to blackmail national states without creating a state at the European level, right? It's, it is the demolition <coughs> of stateness at the national level in favor of a gross promotion uh, program, which uh, uh, which did, then did not uh, occur, uh, was not implemented to the effect anticipated. So, so I don't think this uh, alternative of political versus economic causes of the uh, state weakness that we observe today uh, is uh, very fruitful. I think. We should think about how to integrate it.